Hello, I'm Karen Golden Oronte with Living Histories here at the Historical Society. I am today speaking with Susan Hobson, Abigail Hobson Alps, and Beth Hobson Anderson. So I had the opportunity to briefly discuss with them their growing up in Cohasset. And if you don't know, Beth and Abigail are twins. And Susan. So is not, not a twin. Is our, I'm is just our. a draggler. <laughs> <laughs> so first I'd like to talk about your growing up in Cohasset, or actually when you came to Cohasset. So if we could talk a little bit about your mom and dad. So my parents both grew up in Weymouth, Massachusetts, and they met, I think, when they were 14 and 15. Um, my father was a football player in Weymouth High School in their um, championship days. They went to the Gator Bowl, mm -hmm. and it was a big, big deal. And uh, my mother was a cheerleader, so quite the uh, stereotypical mm -hmm. sort of high school romance that stuck. And he was awarded a scholarship through football to go to Williams College, which, um, you know, in the Horatio Alger type story was a life-changing event mm -hmm. for him. And once he got to Williams, he did ROTC. So when he graduated from college, he joined the Air Force. But right before he joined the Air Force, I think he graduated one Saturday and married my mother the following Saturday. So there was no chance for him to <laughs> escape. Miss out. <laughs> Miss out. That's a nicer way. And then they started sort of traveling all over America while he mm -hmm. did his training. And while they courted in high school and college, they would drive to Cohasset to admire its beauty and dreamt that maybe someday they could live in Cohasset too. So as soon as they were able, we lived in Ridgefield, Connecticut while we were all very young. I think I was the only person born in Massachusetts. So Peter. my, you're right, Rick, Abigail, and Beth were born in California. Mm -hmm. Peter was born in Connecticut. I was born here. Um, and then we moved up here in 1973. I thought it was 72. 72? <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> Somewhere in there. <laughs> I know I was starting fourth grade, so you must have been starting second. So Rick was sixth, and Peter was maybe still at home. So the Osgood School was on Ripley Road, where presently, in present time, 2023, is Ripley at the library mm -hmm. right? and Deer Hill is where it is today in correct fourth correct grade. um so what are your memories of going to school and your class your teachers oh gosh I remember we took the bus we, we voted that we had the coldest bus stop in Cohasset because in the winter sometimes I mean the ocean we get like we were getting wet before we even Pummeled went to school. <laughs> yeah. I, think my, I think fourth grade, I think I had Mrs. Truesdell, was her name? Mm -hmm. um, and was fourth grade open space? Well, it was, was interesting that? because they decided to try a new concept where they called it open space. And it was two, three, four classrooms of students all together in one very large open space. And I think so you were in I was put in there and you were not. Right. I don't know, that no one ever asked us questions how it went. Who knows if they looked at our grades to see how well we did, but it was, they definitely picked one of us to be in that classroom and one of us not. And I, I was a very quiet child, so it was kind of chaotic. Too much chaos for you. Too much chaos for me. So it was interesting because <laughs> way back then, when you were waiting for the school bus, there were probably several roads that all met at one bus stop. They weren't. Or was it just not our bus stop? No, our bus stop was was a deep run, you know, on, off Jerusalem Road. And there weren't when we were younger. There were a lot of children who boarded the bus there, the Donovans, the Lualdes, mm -hmm. some older, cooler kids. But then some of those children went off to private, to private school. school. So right. once once we got into upper grades, it was just the Hobsons. <laughs> but, we, but we always remember Diana Karcher was our bus driver, oh. and we might have sometimes been a little bit late. So we'd, where we were on Deep Run, you'd kind of go up over a little hill, 
And if you saw the top of the bus, you thought, oh, but she, we run down the hill. <laughs> she would usually she wait for us. She nicely, very nicely waited for us. That's <laughs> Yes. Come on, Hobsons, get on the bus. <laughs> so now you continued your careers through Osgood, and then you went up to Deer Hill. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you were in sixth grade? We would have been grade? sixth grade, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you sometimes we overlapped in the schools and mm -hmm. sometimes we didn't. I mean, we all co coalesced at some point at the high school. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Because so junior high school, high school. That's when the high school, the junior high school started at seventh grade. Correct. Unlike sixth grade today. Right. right. So seventh grade, and then you went on into, and how is your high school, junior high school, high school careers? Did you have any particular highlights, courses, oh, teachers? I had some wonderful teachers. Oh, Mr. Mr. Leary. Yeah, Mr. Leary. Mr. Mr. Gilmartin. Davis. Mr. Davis. Davis. From Mal. Yeah. yeah. We were all in the band. Okay. And who was the band? How did the band? Mr. Hyde. Mr. Mr. Hyde, yes. And Mr. Thank Marks you. was the choral yes. director. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're, I, I hope it's the same now, but we had some spectacular mm -hmm. teachers. And we started a color guard. We, we the did. First co so at think. that time, the high school had a marching band. So that was fun because we would be at the high school games and go do a routine at halftime. Oh, it was fun. Fun, yeah. I'm glad there's no video footage. I of know. Yeah. I'm very glad. Because <laughs> somebody it, was a cheerleader. <laughs> wow. Short. Well, we don't want to go there. Sorry. But she and you <laughs> she and Gail was in color guard with how many people? Maybe twelve. Maybe two, ten or twelve. So they had the whole marching band, mm -hmm. and then the colors. We did. Oh, we yeah. Did. Oh, so we had uniforms. One, one of our classmates, Leslie Collins. We're actually going to see her tonight. Her mother was Judy Collins, and Judy and my mother, I think probably mostly Judy, made our uniforms. Oh, nice. Yeah, we had little blue, dark blue vests and. We all bought white shirts and they made us blue and white skirts. <laughs> What's amazing from the photos is just how many um, young people were involved in this. Mm. How many of them were in the garden? Yeah, maybe the garden? 10 or 12. I would say 10 or 12. Okay. And then include the band, maybe 25. I'd say I'm more. Guessing 30. Oh, I don't wow. remember. But there were a lot of yeah. us. Your microphone's <laughs> But it was pretty spectacular for a little town. Mm, yeah. If you had the whole fun band with out the there, flags. the flags. Yeah. yeah. So nice. I don't know when that ended, but I don't think they do have it anymore. So as far as the, your stellar memory teachers, going from Mr. Leary, Mr. Davis, and of course Mr. Thompson. I had him for Tom O'Neill. Um, oh, for Latin, Latin, right? Yeah. He was mm. wonderful. And you took Latin. Yep. Okay. And he would have raves when he, we didn't have to, we wouldn't translate. We, we would just talk about current events, mm -hmm. politics, and sometimes he just put on Masterpiece Theater, I, Claudius. <laughs> and we watched that because set in Rome, so. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so it counts. <laughs> <laughs> so he was a, a, and he drove a Citroen. Remember that? No, Dead. I don't remember what he drove. Oh, wow. He was just oh. a super, yeah. very interesting cosmopolitan guy with a great sense of humor. <laughs> awesome. So now, during that time, we had um, the cafeteria. We had trays of food. I think it was, I don't know if it was 25 cents or 35 cents. We never, we never bought, we were ever never allowed bought to buy lunch. lunch. Hobson's oh, did not buy lunch. No. Okay. So you brought We wanted lunch. to. Yeah. But we no, our mother would bring our lunches to school and put them in the front office with all our names so everybody could see we were mortified. <laughs> all four or five of us Rick from any Hobson, women. Abigail Hobson, Beth Hobson. And then Susan. they would make an announcement with a loudspeaker. You know, <laughs> oh. Abigail Gail Hobson, that's what I was going by Gail then. Your lunch is in the office and you'd sit there. <laughs> she did it. In she later. just couldn't get it done in time for us to make the bus. Okay. We barely so made the bus. We anyway. barely made the bus. So and for some reason we couldn't make our own lunch. So she'd say, I'll bring it up to school. Yeah. <laughs> so, but your dad was traveling during Correct. this time. He was an airline so pilot. So she was initially stay-at-home mom working very differently. She time, acted right? as a single mother probably, yeah. what, 50, 60% of the time? 70% 70 of the time. She never said, wait until your father comes oh, home. No, 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 no. She took care yeah. of it. Oh, and okay. even when he Good. was home, mom was in charge. Yeah. yeah. I'll never forget. I mean, she's raising five, five children. Yeah. 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 She's pretty busy. Age. Yeah. I mean, when we lived in Connecticut, I remember, I don't know if you guys remember this, the basement of our house flooded. 
And I remember she said, okay, put your bathing suits on. Get, I remember she that. gave us each a little bucket. We probably didn't get much accomplished. We bailed it out. We bailed out the basement. And, but I don't ever remember thinking, oh no, like what are we gonna do? Dad's not here. My mother, she handled it. She Whatever it was, she took care of it. If anything, it was odd when he was home. Mm, it was like, oh, Dad's here. Oh. Uh, yeah. Shape up. <laughs> That's, but I was going to say, not only did our mother make our lunches, she made our prom dresses. Oh. We were those children. <laughs> <laughs> did you go pick up fabric with her? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, we were allowed to pick the fabric. And you, but did you have different styles, or you all had the no, same? I think it was the same style. It had to be the same dress, I think. Yeah, no, but still yes. works. Yeah, at the time, it was embarrassing. Now processing. I appreciate it. Yeah. But at the time, it was, can't I just buy a dress? It's bulk <laughs> processing, though. You yes. got to do the name. <laughs> because when we were seniors, Susan was a sophomore. And she was going to our prom. But I don't know about you, Beth, but I didn't have a date yet. Neither one of us had a date. Yes. So our sister had a date before we did for our prom. <laughs> so we had to scramble. I got you a date. Susan got me a date, Chip Bliss, <laughs> in band practice. I remember Susan said, Chip, are you going to the prom? And he said, no, no. And Susan said, well, my sister isn't either, so why don't you two go together? So And you had a nice time, right? I did have a nice time. <laughs> but my older brother teased me relentlessly because it was Chip and Gale, like Chip and Dale, the cartoon <laughs> character. So, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> I do think it was a different childhood. There were no cell phones, no computers. We just went out to play. I just heard on the radio today that children spend four to seven minutes outside unstructured. We spent every afternoon after school, weekends, just running around the neighborhood, riding our bikes somewhere. The protocol was you came home, you changed, changed out of clothes. your school clothes yeah. into your play clothes. Play clothes. That's what they, we called them, our play clothes. Yeah. Go out have fun. Mm -hmm. We had paper routes, we babysat, we but we would lawns. ride our bike, walk down to the water, see our friends. Yeah, we were not allowed to watch. If the sun were out, the TV mm -mm. was not on. There was no idle time. Mm. But there were I five of us, so. You could read a book. We could, oh, we could that definitely read fine, a book. But definitely don't you dare turn that TV on. Yeah. It was called the idiot box. <laughs> and in those days, your parents could tell because it would be warm. Yeah. So if they were out, they could come in and touch it and know if you had it on. Guilty. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had a very nice... I guess what I'd call a traditional childhood, where yeah. we just played and, you know, when we got to high school, we had after school activities. But through and elementary what, school, we just played outside. And what were your after school activities? Uh, well, the band, were you in theater? Mm -mm. No, I think it was just Girl Scouts. Girl Scouts, Scouts. yes, Girl sorry, Scouts. Girl Scouts and the band, pretty much. Mm -hmm. We went all the way through Girl Scouts through our senior year of high school. And who was that counselor? I mean, uh, Louise leader. Smullen and Helen Goodwin. And um, Jeff Steele. And Jeff Steele, yeah. yes, thank you. So we were all first class Girl Scouts. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> Which sounds really geeky, but actually, no, Mrs. Was, Steele yeah. made it super fun. Right. Oh, yeah. Mrs. Steele we, was great. And Mrs. Smullen. We traveled, we went to Montreal. Oh, we, yeah, we went to Mexico. Mexico. Did we go to Hershey Park, Pennsylvania? Yeah. 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 It so we a, did the equivalent of the Eagle Scout. Yeah. We went all the way through, got all the awards, but it was fun. But we'd go camping for a weekend. But I never realized as a child that Louise Smullen's daughters were grown. Mm. And she, she continued didn't have on. children uh, in the program, and she continued to do this for us I and think others. She told me she did this for almost 50 years. I'm, I'm not it. surprised. I believe that. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. she An amazing me. woman. Yeah. Mm. She taught me how to spell calendar. Every time I write that, I think of <laughs> Mrs. Mrs. Oh. When I, I think do. about the women that were there for us, yeah. you know, besides our mother, but the friends the mothers of our friends, our Girl Scout leaders. Mm. We were very fortunate. And they were very involved, I think, in your lives. But mm. not helicopter the way some and parents are today. It wasn't like that at all. They were just, we just knew they were there for us. Yeah. But like you if know, you went to the Collins house, you could just go in. Right. Mm. It was, it was. We had a paper route. So as I'm dropping off the paper, I might smell cookies baking. Oh, mm. oh, come on in, have a cookie. How was your day? Spend yeah. 10, 15 minutes. The paper route would take a long time. Yeah, whoever was after the Collinses, their paper was really late. Like, <laughs> bad now, but or had greasy fingerprints on it. Or had on greasy it. fingerprints on it, exactly. <laughs> so we were fortunate. Yeah. Our parents really wanted us in Cohasset. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was not a random uh, ha happening. That mm -hmm. they they wanted us to grow up here. Yeah. And our father was a sailor, so he wanted to be near the water. So now, what happened when you all graduated? We had to leave. Yeah. We went off to college, <laughs> but we all came back. 
And how far away were you? We went to Westfield State. Yep. Susan that went was, to Wellesley. That was too far for me, so I went to Wellesley. <laughs> Peter went to a variety of places, yeah. ended mm -hmm. up, I think, graduating from... It was know. either Northeastern or Bridgewater State, or I don't know. <laughs> no, it was Mass Art. Oh, was it? I and then our, our older brother went to uh, Mass, Mass Maritime. Maritime. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And, and then you live, didn't you, didn't you live, up, did you ever live away from Massachusetts before mm -hmm. children? No, I lived in Braintree, I've lived in Gardner. My father jokes that nobody ever really goes past 128. We just <laughs> stay right around I here. I lived in yeah. California for eight years. You did, eight, was it eight years? Yeah. Wow. And then Rick, Rick traveled the world. Mm, in the Merchant Marine. Yeah. yeah. I think we all knew we would end up back here. Yeah. In this area. Yeah, by the time we had children, we were all sort of hightailing it back, I think, for the for Same a great education, parents, right? right? Sort of so, close to grandparents. What I found amazing when I was interviewing your dad was that you know he told me who his grandmother was, and I went on Ancestry.com, and I was like, okay, well then who are her parents? Okay. Now we're into the, you know, the earlier 1800s. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, well, who were their parents? And, and then now we're into the late 1700s. I kept going and going. We go way back. And going. So what fascinated me to learn that they both met in Weymouth and had such enormously long lineage in Cohasset. How did that come up in conversation? I mean, did that even come up in a conversation? We'd be told a few stories here and there when we were young, but I found it interesting because I'm the assistant town clerk in Cohasset. So we had a slow period, uh, maybe 10 years ago, and I went in the vault where all the vital records are kept, the birth, death, and marriage records, and I just started, Susan had done some work, but I just started looking at all the actual records and realizing, oh, this was our great-great-grandmother, our great-great-great-great-grandfather, and between the two of us, we were able to put together quite a large yes. um, notebook of information, and we go back to 16-something. Yeah. When Cohasset was still part of Hingham. Yes. So it was interesting because some people, or some people who are watching us, might not be as familiar with how Cohasset was founded. So when there was the mass exodus out of England because of you know, malcontents and religious persecution, et cetera, um, people that traveled at their own expense across the ocean to come to New England were given 50 acres of land, which was great as long as you could pay the, you know, pay the fee. So 50 acres of land um, coming here, um, so we had, um, you have to figure what, I mean, we're looking at it, what it looks like right now. They're coming to completely, you know, no farming areas, no, there's just trees and trees and trees. So it was interesting in looking back at who of your relatives came. So initially. So looking at, um, as we know, Hingham was part of, uh, Coasa was part of Hingham. So when the Hobart's family, the Hobart family left England, um, they were leaving an area outside of London called Hingham. So when they decided to, actually they settled closer to Bear Cove, because at least it was somewhat flat and, mm -hmm. and, and being able to farm it. So when I looked back, okay, well, the, here's Peter Hobart, your 10 times great-grandfather coming to America, and um, here he is right there mm -hmm. in Bear Cove. <laughs> and then, you know, that is pretty amazing to have that lineage. Mm -hmm. So, and then when we were then further reading about, and his, um, his son, Nehemiah, mm -hmm. was the very first 
pastor in Cohasset when Cohasset was allowed to have a meeting hall because they you're initially you're not allowed they were they were not allowed so and then again your eight times grandfather great grandfather is now the you know the pastor here in Cohasset. Um, and then um, talking about the um, first, um, the West Augusta settlement that was pretty ill, was a failed colony or failed uh, settlement. And Phineas Pratt <laughs> ran from West Augusta all the way to Plymouth to get Miles Standish to sail up the coast and save those starving <laughs> settlers. Mm -hmm. And now, meanwhile, his son, Aaron, is, you know, you know he's your eight times great-grandfather. So he has 15 kids, which really helped him in his farming career. <laughs> mm -hmm. He was number, one of the number one farmers mm -hmm. here in Cohasset. So when you read these historical stories of the town, I just find it fascinating to have such lineage. Actually, fascinating. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of jealous. I think uh, because I get stuck when I'm doing my ancestry. It only goes back so far. Um, but to have this all right here, I, I could just I call mean, my sister. We're very I fortunate. I think this is really something. Or we all of. just lack genetically imagination <laughs> to go well, somewhere else. <laughs> well, no, I think we're often, home bodies. Yeah, home bodies. Well, there's I am. A reason that there's, I think it's like it's maybe it's part of your genetics. They they never they all lived here. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's not been, you know, and I'm sure there's a lot of people that would like to continue to live on and on and on mm. and have all of their children continuing to live on in Cohasset. Um, as well as other um, members of their family, but it's just not that way today. You know, so things change. My husband teases me that uh, we are all hefted to the land like a sheep. You know how like you don't have to pen a sheep because yeah. a sheep will only go so far. Yeah. <laughs> so we're all hefted to Cohasset. Okay. But I also agree with you that we are very fortunate that we can live with our parents um, in the same town where we grew up, but I don't know if any of our children will live in Cohasset, Hingham, Citrus. They can't afford to. Yeah, they can't. It just they can't. changes. It's very, very unlikely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. even when you look back at townies, with they, I mean, they're not, they're not all able to have no. their children live here, and even though their relatives might have come in the mid 1800s from the Azores, that their kids can't afford to live here. So uh, anyway, I think this is really quite quite something. But um, so I, there was one story about your six times great grandfather, Levi Tower, on your mom's side. Um, he was a very, he was very much of an entrepreneur. He had, he owned the blacksmith shop. He had four stores or something down by the comma, by the harbor. Um, he was a master carpenter. He had built 12, almost nine ships or something like that, mm. vessels. Oh. And um, he was also the town moderator to build the, the academy on the common, the school, the, this town school, um, which is where the uh, town Our hall house. is now. So it was very interesting because I was reading that um, they charge 44 cents a week to go to school there, and plus firewood. Um, <laughs> and it cost to build that academy $1,924.90. So, and to underline how yeah, little we travel, that. I now live in, in the Cohasset Academy. Right. Because it was picked up and moved, moved to Beach Street. Street. And Susan lives, I, that's her house. Yes. That is, <laughs> Really yeah. amazing. That is amazing. So the fact that your six times great grandfather had something to do with the house you live in now. Mm. Pretty amazing. That that you just taught me something. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. And so, we get to go and we don't have to pay forty four cents or bring firewood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I learned something too. That is 
is pretty cool. Yeah. So, and there you go. And um, Daniel Tower, who was your 10 times great grandfather or something, his land was on from Beach Street all the way down to the ocean. Right, we're Lynn. To Giacomo oh, Lewis. That yeah. was the homestead. Oh. Yeah. So it's pretty Ooh. right down the street. Mm -hmm. So your neighbors to his house. <laughs> pretty cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. So anyway, so I, I would like to ask, do you have anything that you would like to, for the posterity of the Cohesive Historical Society Living History, here is your mm -hmm. chance to say something. <laughs> Well, one of the one of the things I like most, and it happened for you too, is our children graduated from the same school that we did, mm -hmm. and it was for me quite the trip to be at the music circus to see my children graduate, and it felt like I had just been in those robes right. maybe the week before. <laughs> we just done the same thing, yeah. <laughs> right? And I was also talking to a friend about staying in the same place staying in contact with high school friends um, and being known by people your, my whole life, say. Yeah. I say that it, um, it makes me feel accountable for like, the, who I am. That sounds sort of silly, but like you can't put on airs. You can't pretend you're somebody you're not. Yeah. Everybody knows exactly who you are, and I find that a very sort of cozy and comforting feeling. Mm -hmm. I do, too. It's nice to grow up to live now where we grew up. Yes, yeah. And see people we've known for, well, we moved here when I was 10, so I have friends coming over tonight that I've known for 50 years. Yeah, that's, that, yeah, that's yeah, And they just had their reunion. I had mine the same year because theirs was delayed for COVID and- And it yeah. was spectacular yeah. to see people you've known since elementary school. Yeah, there, and there's also much. quite a few who are still here. Absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. Even in, in the town or very, very or close. Or very close, right, Situate, yeah. Hingham, Marshfield. Right. So we're not the only ones who stick around. Right, right. <laughs> well, we also come from great stock. We're very fortunate. Yes. Yeah, well, your dad was the treat. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> He's a wonderful man. Yeah. I think he kind of it subtly, or maybe not always so subtly, kind of made it known that I would like you here. He was very unhappy when Susan went to California. Yeah. But he would, at the dinner table, he'd say, so who will take care of me when I'm old? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And now uh, we are. And now yeah. we are. <laughs> now we are. <laughs> well, we also, we weren't lectured, but we definitely were told and got the message that our lineage, who we come from, we have relatives in Beechwood in, in Joy Place, and that that was very special and important. Yeah, yeah we had field trips to the local cemeteries to to underline, mm. and, and lots of we'd go on like um, family tours in, in the car when we were little, and we'd right. point, things would be pointed out like your grandparents' house, your great grandparents' oh, yeah, house. Yeah. Just Thank so, you. yeah, like Beth said, we it was very it rooted us. So yeah, you did. Yeah. So part of this that we'll see in in the finished result is your walk through Central Cemetery, Central Cemetery and, and right. um, Beechwood Cemetery, mm -hmm. and. Um, it was interesting because Susan Pratt, the or Sarah Pratt, um, was the first person uh, buried at Central Cemetery. She, by the way, just as a reminder, is the one who had 15 babies. So, um, mm, no wonder she yeah. ended up in a cemetery. And she passed away at 42. 42. Oh. Mm. Oh. Yeah. Whoops. Mm. I didn't know she was the, she was the first person interred there. I that didn't I didn't know that wow. either. Every day's a school day. Yeah, <laughs> it is. <laughs> so, and it's pretty amazing when you look at the living histories that had been um, filmed or recorded years ago. Um, people, and you know, we, we I watch them and think it's there are things I had no idea about. And I mean, unless we capture these moments, mm -hmm. um, someone in fifty years from now is going to say. They took a bus to school. <laughs> right, right. Um, anyway, well, speaking, of, yeah, that's something that, you know, things change. So now we have it documented, and I really appreciate the time. Oh, you're welcome. That you've well, thank taken you, Karen. To, um, 
We appreciate your time too. <laughs> nice of you to do like this. Now know anyway. more about our family than we do. <laughs> now, yeah, well, no. Now I, I right now and appreciate where you guys come from. Anyway, well, thank you very much for listening to us on Living Histories, and look forward to see you again. Bye now.